Howdy, Jacob here. Today we're going to do an in-depth analysis on ACCO Brands Corporation. Actually, the second video I did of our dividend yield screener. So we're going way back. The current price is within 7% of a buy price based on my initial assumptions. I plan on going over some of the um, notes that I took away from quarterly reports and their most recent 10K, as well as do a quick overview of the company prior and put, finally put in my new assumptions based on what I was reviewing um, from their 10K and new assumptions to come up with the new present value of earnings and cash flow. So just keep in mind, everything I say will be in my opinion. Do what you want with it. Please do your own analysis in conjunction with my review. It's not meant to be end all be all. This isn't going to be the price that I buy it at. I will do further research if it does look to be a more appropriate stock price. Um, this is just looking through quarterly, the most recent four or five quarterly reports, most recent 10K. And then if, if this now looks like a buy, then I'll do further research on the industry as a whole, where I think that they are within the industry. And if I think that uh, they will perform, outperform their competitors or if the price is so stupidly cheap that they really don't even need to. But uh, let me start to get to the analysis. Let's do a quick overview of the company. We're looking at a $467 billion market cap on $1.3 billion enterprise value in the commercial services and supplies industry. Quite a bit of debt here. 0.6 price to book, but it's not necessarily a tangible price to book since we do have $590 million goodwill and the $816 million other intangible assets. So you can't really fall back on the company to sell all their assets off in the form of giving money back to their shareholders since um, you know the, the goodwill and intangibles is really just maybe trademarks or something that's gonna give them an advantage in selling or supposedly give them an advantage and uh, competitive advantage. We do see gross margin up a little bit this year, but really flat around the 30% range, operating margin down a little bit into the high, t high single digit from the 10% range it was in the early and mid 2010s. Pretty low return on invested capital, so nothing to brag home about, but they are paying a dividend that um, just pays out about $28 million of their five-year average free cash flow of over 100 so you're looking at about 25%, so nothing crazy substantial there. Some of the notes that I took from the quarterly reports, I have their CEO focuses is focusing on margin expansion, accelerating new product development, and generating strong cash flow to support their quarterly dividend and reduce debt. So to me, that sounds like they're of the five things you can do with your free cash flow of make acquisitions, reinvest back in yourself, pay a dividend, repay purchase shares, pay down debt. They're focusing on their dividend and their debt reduction. And they are focusing on strong cash flow, which I do like. As long as the company calls out cash flow and produces a hefty amount of it, I do enjoy that. So that's a positive for me. But, you know, for dividends and debt, like I do think focusing on debt for them makes a lot of sense since their enterprise value is almost 200% of their market cap. But, um, you know, the dividend, maybe it's time to buy that shares, maybe not. We'll see when we get to there, but uh, when we get to the final price. But I do know dividends and debt reduction, if you use too much of that for cash, uh, your capital allocation, then you're not leaving a whole lot of room to reinvest and uh, buy back shares that are hopefully really cheap. Uh, their sales were, are expected to climb this year five to seven percent, so pretty hefty sales decline. Um, whether that's going to hold or not, you know, depends, but they are focusing on margin expansion, so you will probably see a little five percent, five to seven percent revenue reduction. Um, there's a good chance we see a flat or possibly even increasing in for sure. Operating sales geographically are almost 50% in America, 30% Europe, and then the rest, other international, where the USA sales are down the most, 11%, Europe down 6%, international up 8%. So their largest section just geographically distributed are declining the most. Their smallest geographical uh, sales are increasing. Uh, but just just to point that out, um, so it sounds like you know they're they're making good traction in international sales, and there's a good chance that in a couple of years that you know it could be more of their their sales and revenue coming from international, which 
would be a positive thing in the fact that they're diversifying all their sales and everything. So I don't see that being a problem. Their top 10 customers account for roughly 42% of sales. Uh, so good, not a lot of customers, good amount of sales. So it's not, they're, they're a little bit, you know, relying or they're relying on a few number of uh, customers. One of the quotes I have from their 10K that I found interesting is they say the size, scale, and relative competitive market position of certain large customers gives them significant leverage in business negotiations. Additionally, the competitive environment in which our large customers operate has made and will continue to make our business with them challenging and unpredictable. So I found it interesting to basically say, this is, you know, if you're reading through the risks, a lot of them are fugazi, fugazi, stupid, don't make any sense. Some of them are pretty important. I mean, the, the stupidest one I see most commonly is that our stock price is volatile. It's like absolutely no doubt. But there are, when you do read risks related to the business, risk factors, you can point out some important things. And I do think this is important. This is basically saying that the customer has a lot of the power in both pricing negotiations as well as keeping them as a, as a client. And so that is a little bit tough. It, it's not quite like Apple when, you know, the customer really would pay anything for an Apple phone. I mean, to a degree, obviously, but who would have thought phones would be selling for $1,500, $1,500, and people would just be buying it like it's nothing, even though they're making, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, which is you know, a sad reality, but it's the way it is. They're saying in this case, this, that's not the case um, for this company. If, if, you know, their competitors are selling for cheaper, um, they're either able to say, you know, maybe, hey, there's some for this, we're going to go with them, or they, then they're going to have to, ACCO is going to have to lower their prices, which would diminish their margins. So their, their customers are really the ones with the pricing power here. Um, you know, take that how you want it. Their debt has about 36 mil due in 2024, 36 in 2025, 277 in 2026, and 575 million due in 2029. So the first three have a variable interest rate at about 6.3 percent, and then the 575 mil due in 2029 is at a fixed 4 uh, percent. In relation to their cash flow, their five-year average is about 100 million, maybe a little bit more. So they will have to focus on paying down that debt quite a bit, which we can see from their last three years. Uh, capital allocation, we see about 6% share repurchases, which all happened in 22Q2. Uh, there was no other even quarter that they repurchased shares, which is interesting because if you look at their share count prior to the last two years, they decreased it very substantially from 114 million to 95 million over a six, mil six year period, but then are relatively flat and are actually increasing it due to share, um, due to was it share dilution from um, stack based compensation? That's where I was going. Uh, about 26% of their three year average is going towards dividend and then 53% to debt pay down. So, again, of all the things you can do with cash, debt doesn't do anything for you. It just makes the company more a safer company. And so, if companies are just focusing all their capital allocation on reducing debt, that, that's, that can be good for companies with a lot of debt, especially due soon. Maybe they're paying so much in interest that it makes sense. But to you as the shareholder, they're not, you're not really seeing that besides the company just being more safe to invest in. And if people are you know, valuing it at, at a enterprise value, then yeah, it's cheaper. But the, the main forms of handing money back are through reinvesting and hopefully that creates more business, buying back shares that, or, you know, just make the company more, your your portion of the share is worth more or paying a dividend where you can either reinvest or, you know, invest in something else. But I think really my biggest thing here was just, I declined the revenue a little bit and then I put the PE and price to free cash flow similar to my uh, most previous in-depth videos. I'm trying to make that more based on their enterprise value than their market cap since I do want to take into consideration debt into my situation here. And because they have quite a bit of debt in relation to their market cap, and they're going to be focusing a lot of that on it, we're not going to be seeing a whole lot of increase in revenue through reinvestment or acquisition or margin expansion likely. And so I think I'm pretty comfortable with this. And we're saying the company's stock price needs to fall 36% before you get a buy, uh, before you get a 15% return for me. Again, not where I'm buying it, but 
do hope you learned something and enjoy the beginning of the grace for you.